welcome. Thank you for joining us today. We are so thrilled that you have chosen to dial in and, and pull up the, today's episode. Again, the only national broadcast in the nonprofit sector. So we have spent the last two years every weekday dedicating uh, at least 30 minutes to thought leaders across the nation and topics that continue to change in and around our sector. Today, we are so thrilled to have back with us Jill Krumbacher, and Jill serves as the Senior VP of Marketing and Development, so that's a couple of hats right there, uh, with the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption, and we are excited to have more conversation with you because a couple of weeks ago, uh, you came on and we actually had a full week dedicated to the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption and partway through that week, both Julie and I were like, we need more time with Jill uh, <laughs> to talk about this marketing and development concept as they, you, have found a way to have the two of these entities partner and work in tangent with one another. So. Julie, Julie and I are thrilled to have you back. If you haven't met us yet, Julia is the CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. I'm Jarrett Ransom, CEO of the Raven Group, but fondly known as the Nonprofit Nerd. And again, for two years, 30 minutes every weekday, we continue to have the support from the sponsors you can see on the screen. We are extremely grateful to have their continued investment and support in these conversations. and little do you know we've got a lot up our sleeves for next year and many of these companies are sticking around to help us do more and reach more uh, throughout the nation as we all continue to navigate forward so thank you to our sponsors and again jill welcome back thank you thank you it's good to be here again you know we were so intrigued by many many things that we heard about through our week with the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption. So many interesting things. We covered policy, we covered fundraising, we covered marketing, we covered board uh, work, leadership, all these things. And tucked there in the middle was this day where we talked with both you and your CEO about this really interesting structure that you have done. And that's what we wanted to bring you back on because you have you actually lead both the marketing and the development team. That's correct. I mean, you have to repeat that to me because I'm just like so taken aback. Yes, absolutely. Uh, both teams um, report to me, and we really think of ourselves as one big department. So, um, one happy family, if you will. Wow, amazing! So, we started chatting, um, you know, in the sector that we were going to have you on, and. And what an interesting opportunity and unique position um, this is. And we've had, we've been witnessing so many people start this conversation about, wait a minute, what can this work? You know, how does it work? And so that's what we wanted to dig in. And so let's start off by having you explain to us, what's your day look like? I mean, how many people do you lead? You mentioned in the chitty chat chat that you, you have your own portfolio. Talk to us about that. Sure. Um, well, my day is probably evenly split between marketing and development. Um, my role is to uh, oversee both clearly, um, but I've got some strong, um, you know, director level and VP level that lead up um, some of the teams um, in, in support of me. And so that I think is really key to what I do. Um, so my day typically looks like meeting with the leaders of my teams, um, our vice president of marketing and communications, and then we have two senior directors that lead up um, a couple different channels in our fundraising team. And so I'm regularly meeting with them, talking about their goals, talking about what's happening um, in their particular units, how their metrics are looking, um, and you know, problem solving, helping be their champion. That's really my role, helping them think of things, um, solve problems. Um, but in, in addition, yes, I do have a portfolio. It's not the size of, of the others um, on my team, that's what they carry. Um, but I do have a portfolio um, that tends to focus on our higher end and donors um, and, and what they need. 
and in, also in support of Rita as our CEO. So I spend time supporting Rita, um, bringing donors to her that she may need to talk with and helping her, helping her plan for those as well. So I do have a portfolio, um, but usually um, I'm spending a lot of time on a daily basis meeting with my team leads and talking at, level, at, at, at a deep level about what's going on in their organizations and just helping them vision cast and problem solve and, and do the great work that they do. Wow. Jill, you mentioned uh, that the foundation has been on a steady hiring string now for about three years. Yes. How many individuals are we talking that make up this marketing and development team? Right. So in our entire organization, we're at about 54 right now. On the marketing and development team, we are hiring our 20th right now. So we are um, a, a team of 20 at this moment. That is amazing. And how does this, how do these 20 individuals work together? You said, you know, they both report to you, but it's really one big team, one big happy family. How might we as an organization, as we move into next year, start to consider what this combined effort or combined team setup and makeup might look like? What should we consider? Sure. You know, I think for us, there's a couple of reasons why this makes sense and why we, we decided to go this way with our organization. First of all, would probably be my background. So when I came into the organization, I had um, my depth was in marketing and it was for profit marketing and probably every um, every focus you could have in marketing I had had um, in the for-profit world. Um, but also towards um, the later years of my career, I was also managing sales teams. And um, so that was my background. I came in with both marketing and sales experience. Um, I did not come in with nonprofit experience. Um, now we would all know working in, at a nonprofit fundraising is not sales, but there are a lot of tactics. There are a lot of practice, best practices that are similar. And so I think my background and having run organizations um, under me before that were both marketing and sales together, um, that seemed to make sense when I joined the, the organization under Rita Sornan to um, really lead these efforts. Um, and I think there's a couple of things that make sense as to why this works for us. Um, and I think one of them is the fact of where we are in our organizations, our organization's growth. We come from a history of strong support from the Wendy's company. We still have strong support from the Wendy's company and it's growing each and every year. They continue to up um, and increase what they're doing for us. But as our work really uh, grows um, and expands at a dramatic level, we really want everyone to be able to join us in this work. Right? And we know that a lot of people have a passion for this work and we want them to join our mission. And so because we're aggressively growing, we find ourselves in a vast donor acquisition stage at the foundation. That is the stage that we are the heaviest in. Yes, we have donors up that donor journey that are major gift donors um, that, you know, have us in their, their wills and estates um, that give it the leadership annual giving level. Yes, we have those donors, but we are really focused on donor acquisition um, and at the lower levels of giving. And I think that's one of the reasons why this works for our organization, um, because a lot of the tools that a national nonprofit is going to use, who's not uh, a university with alumni as your list of, of you know, potential donors, right? We've got to go find potential donors. And a lot of the tools you're going to use to do that are marketing tools. And so we are going to get those donors through digital media, through digital ads, um, through email campaigns, through direct mail. Um, so a lot of those are the expertise that the marketing team has through social media, right? And so for us, I think it, um, it makes total sense for us to be combined because we are focused on that stage of our work. We are looking for rapid growth in the numbers of donors um, that we're attracting annually year over year. So in this journey to doing that, I mean, I'm, it's riveting what you said. And, and I love 
the strategic focus. And one of those things that Rita touched on when you we were with us for the week, uh, the nonprofit uh, power week was that, you know, you are so blessed to have the tie into the Wendy's corporation and to your founder, but it is incorrect to believe that you are funded by them, that you still have to go out and market and raise and, you know, fundraise and everything. So I see where you're going with this, but now I've got to ask the big question, chicken or egg, chicken or egg, (laughs) does marketing drive development? or does development drive marketing? I would answer this by saying it is 100% the development goals that drive marketing. So our development, our fundraising goals, the dollars that we need to sustain this organization and keep keep our organization moving forward, we've charted those out year over year. We know what they look like, um, you know, the next five years out, 10 years out, we think, right? Everyone has to revisit those, but we know how aggressively we need to grow. And so for us, those development goals are driving our marketing department. You know, our marketing team, um, one of the re- reasons why why they're so involved, number one is, is, is donor acquisition, like I said, but also brand awareness. Our marketing Department is in charge of brand awareness. And if people don't know who you are, you're not going to fundraise. So, um, so even that, their brand awareness goals are supporting development, truly. I have perhaps a curveball question. Okay. So I have a I have a son, he's 11, he's always on YouTube, right? And so I have now started going onto YouTube to say, well, you know, what is he looking at? And oh, I can I can find all of these videos here. I was shocked, shock, shocked to see um, a nonprofit advertisement on YouTube. Yep. And that to me is like, whoa, of course, of course, this is now, you know, one of the go-to channels. Have you ventured your marketing efforts into YouTube and how long have you been there and how is that, how is that working for you? Yes, we have. Um, We actually have um, a digital agency that helps advise us. So in in, in addition to um, our 20 employees, we do have two external agencies, one that helps us with our digital um, fundraising and digital awareness, and one that helps us with our direct mail. And that's all new within the last couple of years Um, because that digital space is growing so quickly I do not know anyone who could keep a portfolio, try to do all that work and keep up with that, that, that changing work. I think that's a challenge. So we are blessed to have a digital agency who keeps their eye on this kind of thing and is, is able to tell us, hey, we should try this, we should try that. So YouTube, yes, just within, I would say, the last six months, we have been out on YouTube and what we've been trying to discover is can we fundraise on YouTube or can we just build awareness on, on YouTube? And we all know awareness will then often lead to fundraising. So it's a, is it an immediate thing or, or is it just an awareness thing? Right now for us, it's primarily an awareness um, tool, um, but it's growing and we're continuing to really test within that area and watch it to try different things and, and see how it works. But yes, we, you would see ads from, from on YouTube for the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption, for sure. That's fascinating to me because when I saw it, I thought, whoa, this is bizarre. And then I thought, well, of course, because as you said, technology continues to advance and the platform in which we seek information and entertainment, you know, mm-hmm. why not be in these spaces? So that's, That's really interesting. So you said unequivocally the development goals Goals. really is what drives the marketing efforts and initiatives. Yes, it drives both. The development goals drive the development team and the marketing team in our organization. Yes. So now you're you're so, um, I can tell by your approach, you're probably super, super organized about tracking and measuring and evaluating. I got to ask this quest question. Mm-hmm. Can one of these departments do better than a, another or are you measuring both? How are you measuring them together? I mean, yep. what does that look like? Because um, 
it's really an interesting conundrum if one part's falling down and the other's coming up. Or, I mean, I would imagine there are these, these pieces of that. Yeah, that's a great question. And we just went through this exercise um, about our measurements and tracking our data um, just this past year. So we, we meet and present with the marketing committee of our board on a um, quarterly basis. And we show to them, we have um, a marketing scorecard full of data that we present to them. And we have a development fundraising scorecard um, that we present to them. And what you might expect is it's challenging to separate the two types of, of data for us, which again is a reason why we're one department, because it's so hard to separate. And when you try to separate them on two different scorecards, you see just how interconnected they are. But basically on our fundraising scorecard, we're watching clearly dollars in the door. We're watching numbers of new donors. We're watching returning donors. Um, we are watching um, particular channels that are doing really well for us. Um, we're watching growth year over year. It's very heavy on um, dollar metrics or numbers of donors. On the marketing side, we also include some fundraising metrics. Um, the, the, the top of the top of the marketing metrics, you know, to, to, or the development metrics, I'm sorry, because again, marketing is supporting fundraising and you need to keep your eye on the, on that ball. But, um, also on the marketing scorecard would be things like the brand awareness, or we survey every five years, American attitudes about adoption across the country and in Canada, that survey data is on there. Um, engagement on social media, growth on social media, um, list growth is on there. Um, so not just donors, how many people are donating to us, that would be on the fundraising scorecard, but how many people are following along, right? That may then sometime become a donor. And so that audience is sort of separately watched on the marketing scorecard. So we are very data-driven um, in everything that we do and have separate metrics as much as possible to try to keep our eye on, on both of those things. Now you mentioned something very interesting, and that is, is that you're actually reporting quarterly to a marketing committee within, that serves the board. Yes. I'm wondering, I'm assuming that these are predominantly um, franchisee, fr franchise holders that are on that um, committee? Our board is made up of franchise, um, partly of franchisees for the Wendy system, um, these corporate um, senior executives supply to the Wendy system, but then we also have external um, partners, um, external um, expertise mm -hmm. on uh, our board as well. So we have um, we have a, a reporter um, who serves on our our marketing committee. We've got people who work in child welfare um, on the board. So, but there are franchisees, of course, yes, who who would serve on our marketing and fundraising committees. So I'm curious, do they ever come back at you and challenge you on what you're reporting out? Or are they, I mean, how engaged are they on this? Because this is a heavy ask to get somebody that's serving um, on a national board than to drill down. And I'm wondering what that looks like. Does that help you? Does that suck up energy? I mean, I know you have to walk a line here, but you yeah. know, what's that reality? You know, our, our board committees are extremely engaged and yes, they're serving on a nonprofit board. It's volunteer, right? But um, particularly on our marketing committee, we've got people who work in marketing at the Wendy's company on a corporate level um, and they're very engaged. Um, and how are, how those committee meetings feel like is here's how all the data Here's the best that we know how to do. Here's what we're doing with our budgets this year. And we agree upon our goals with those committees at the beginning of the year. We say, here's the goals we're setting for ourselves. And here's why. Here's how much higher it is than last year. You know, here's what we think it's going to take to get here. And they bless those goals. And then every quarter, we report back to them on how it's going. And so sometimes we say, oh, it, it's out of the park. And they just cheer. And sometimes we say, okay, this one, this one's looking a little different than we thought it would. 
And they'll bring their expertise, you know, many of them don't work in the nonprofit space, but they do work in the for-profit space. And they'll say, hey, that's really interesting. You know, we struggled with this over here, or we learned this over here. Does this help you? Might this help you? So they, it is a very much um, all hands on deck, all brains on deck during that hour. Here's our success rate. Here's what's really working. Here's what we're struggling with. And it's an all in, have you thought about this? Have you tried this? Oh, maybe we could do this. You know, that is how the, how the committees work together. So um, it's, it's a great use of an hour. I think you mentioned in the power week some A-B testing. How experimental do you get with your goals? Um, you know, I don't know if our goals are that experimental. We set our goals based on number one, um, last year's uh, last year's numbers, last year's growth. We're always going to try to increase that year over year and our long-term objectives and where we know we need to hit. Sometimes we're setting a goal that's higher than what the industry would tell you you need to, to do. We, we, we're known to do that um, because we've got a goal, doggone it, and we need to serve this many children across the United States and we're going to do everything we can to get there. So, um, so our goals aren't necessarily experimental, but the ways we try to meet those goals are. And it, um, again, sometimes that comes into play with our with our partners who would see um, one thing about having a, an agency at your disposal, if you can afford to make the investment, is that they are seeing the results of organizations, 20 other organizations sometimes. And that is a Trevor Trove of information. And what we've learned and what they're able to tell us is, um, you know, in a direct mail piece or in a digital ad, these colors or these types of messages work well in um, healthcare organization. These work well in animal welfare. These work well on advocacy or, or political endeavors. And so coming in, we didn't know what we were. We didn't fit well within one of these that says you do it this way or that way or this way. So we had to test things to figure out which one we would act the most like, if that makes sense. Um, because they had that knowledge of how things tend to work in, in nonprofit, but we were a unique little unicorn um, in nonprofit space of foster care adoption. We weren't sure where we would fit. So that's where we would take some of their knowledge. Well, some organizations do it well if you do it this way and some do it well if you do it this way. So we would A-B test and try to figure out and, and do both and put it out there, split the list and see which one had a higher rate. Um, that's why we would do those things because we didn't know which, which method might work best for donors who are attracted to our issue. And just as you said, your background was really in, in sales and also yes. in marketing. Yes. So many of the individuals on your committee, as you said, may not be working within a nonprofit, but can still bring those best practices to say, might we try this? Because this is what the industry is seeing elsewhere. I'm huge on benchmarking, right? Generic, yes. competitive, what's working? Why is it working? How might that relate to us and our mission? Uh, so I love hearing that because, you know, I, I don't think that our nonprofit sector is eager to take risk often enough. <laughs> Even when it comes to A-B testing, you know, it's more of this whole approach, this buckshot approach of we're just going to send the same message, the same colors, the same image, the same everything to everyone. And clearly that's not always the right method especially when you're looking at marketing, brand awareness, development, fundraising, and how those two play with one another. So I just love hearing this, Jill. It's very refreshing yeah. and, um, and inspiring, honestly. Part of that comes from when you're doing that type of testing, you have to understand you're making an investment. And that particular fundraising piece may not set the world on fire in the fundraising results because you split the list and you're doing it two different ways. And you're doing that as an investment to learn which way is best so that your next one does hit it out of the park. And so being able and having permission to make an investment is a blessing that I have at this organization 
and that our board supports. And I understand that not everyone has that. They're under the pressure of, I, you know, I've, I've, got to, I've got to make it big this year. I can't make an investment to test. But if you don't make the investment to test and understand it is an expense that you have to do so that your future is much more um, profitable, has a lot more revenue, then you're never going to know if you're really doing things, if you're really hitting things out of the park like you could be. So that, that is the why. Understanding I'm making an investment in this um, and that's okay because I'm gonna learn and then that is gonna catapult me forward in my fundraising in the future, but maybe not this month. You know, I love that you use the word investment because that's one of those things that we don't use that word in the nonprofit sector. Um, and it seems like such a for-profit word, but I think that's a great mindset to take a look at how and why you're going to be doing some of these things that ultimately come back and, and serve your organization. So I really love that you helped frame it up this way for so many of our viewers that need to go back to their teams and try and sell them on how to do something different. Yeah. This has been magical. As our time with you has been magical, it's been great. I mean, Jarrett and I were, again, so impressed with your team and the things that you said. And we just, um, through serendipity, found you and your organization. And so it's been really fun. Here's Jill's information. We're going to have this discussion more and more, I think, throughout our sector as we look at how we navigate these two divergent yet similar paths within our organizations. Jill Krumbacher, wow, thank you. It's my pleasure. It was really um, great to be with you and to all of you marketing and development folks out there doing the hard work after day after day, keep going. You are funding missions across this country and across this world that we need you, um, we needs you. And so keep going. Thank you. Thank you. That's powerful. And, and uh, Jarrett and I echo that sentiment. It definitely really powerful. We're so delighted that again, once again, we could have another wonderful episode. Thank you to all of our sponsors that have stepped up and that allow us to have these amazing dialogues um, that I don't know where you would find them anywhere else. So thank you for your transparency and sharing with us the amazing journey of your organization. Hey, everybody, as we would like to remind everyone as we end this day, Stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here tomorrow, everyone. Bye.